folks. Um, the next host actually is going to be Ray Yoon for the next two um, speakers as he is uh, more knowledgeable of what they do and, and who they are. Um, I will read a little intro though. Uh, we are very happy to welcome Joshua Chua, who is uh, based out of, I believe, uh, Cambodia right now. Yes. Oh, well, thank you, hey, Joshua. Nice to meet you. My name is Peter. <laughs> yep, Peter. Uh, we have Steve there, and, and Ray is, is here as well today. Uh, he's, he's muted. I'm going to make him co host. All right. And I'm going to ask Ray to unmute. Um, but I'm going to read the intro for you. Joshua Chua has been a humanitarian aid worker since 2003, and his passion has helped those in need. He has mobilized short-term medical projects and humanitarian aid to a number of developing Asian nations, including Thailand, Indonesia, Cambodia, and Myanmar. For the past eight years, he has been based in Cambodia, where his main focus has been to organize mobile medical clinics to help the poor and needy living in rural provinces. Joshua has persevered through enormous difficulties. He has lived in slums with the poor, uh, suffered a heart attack, and endured poverty to the point where he himself ran out of money to buy food. In response to this hardship, he invented a self-sustainable food growing system encompassing vertical farming drums and the production of organic fertilizers. He has used this micro enterprise system to help people in many of the Cambodian provinces and started to expand internationally to countries like Australia, Bhutan, India, Malaysia, and Nepal. Joshua's vision is to continue this expansion into more and more developing nations. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So yes, uh, hi, Joshua. Hi, good, mor good morning. It's 7 yeah, thank you for here. joining us. No worries, yeah. So this is my first time presenting, so I'll just present what I've done. So, uh, shall I start now? Right. I, somebody got to let me share my... Yes, thank you. Sunday, that, that's correct. Who can share? Uh, all panelists, right? All panelists. Okay. How do I click on? Okay. How can I get rid of this? Okay. So, uh, how do I start? So, right now, uh, uh, in Cambodia, right now, I'm teaching the people how to be self sufficient in uh, 200 square meters of land. So uh, many of the farmers here, they have big land and they do a crop, maybe majority of is rice farming. And then some have mangoes or uh, banana plantation, papaya. So the problem is like, once they have, uh, how to say, planted their crops and waiting for the harvest, that period of free time, they don't do anything. So they still in the like poverty and poor. And uh, so with this system of the four areas, how I came about was through the many years of uh, doing the different agriculture. So the first part, uh, it's the section with trees, there's 10 papayas, six banana trees, 10 pumpkins, 10 ginger, turmeric, and uh, the rest. How do I remove this? Hang on. Yeah, got it. So, hang on. Uh, and then the second section, another seven meters by seven meters, you have two fish pond, which you dig in the ground and plant the fish. And then the third section, you have vegetables, but you only plant, plant uh, up to 10, maximum 10 variety, uh, 10, 10, 10 of each variety. That means you have 10 tomatoes, 10 cucumbers, eggplant, and so on. And the last part is poultry. So all of these inside there is like a cycle system where things get recycled. So let's start. So in, in, the, in the 7 meters by 7 meters, which is around 21 feet by 21 feet, uh, with these trees, when you plant, example, you start plant plant 10 banana plants, they can have like uh, they, a monthly food of bananas, just say one papaya yielding, likewise with banana, pumpkins. So these are like the survival food. Okay. 
And this is an area, seven to eight meters. This is a place which I did in Cambodia. So this family is uh, uh, staying at a local church. So there's two families. One is, is a, a, a widow that's uh, putting her effort in there with a few orphan children and another poor family. So with this land, we landfilled it. And then we started planting bananas. So right now, and then the sweet. So this is the period. I don't have the latest update photos because it's all overgrown. Uh, so these are the root, the crops that I suggested them to plant. So there's bananas, there's sweet potatoes at my place, different from the church, the ground there. Just now, it's uh, uh, I have sweet potatoes, and uh, and carrots, and turmeric ginger. Okay, so and bananas and papayas and some other herbs. So these are the crops that I tell them to plant. So imagine the papaya trees. So you can have like one, you can harvest one papaya plant, the, the, the fruits and eat for maybe two, 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 three weeks. And also at the same time, after you have eaten the, the, the papaya, I don't know, the banana, the trunk can be harvested to feed your livestock. Example for chickens and, and, and ducks. So we, we cut this into like smaller pieces and give back as a feed. And then this is like a papaya tree. <laughs> There's a lot. So imagine you have one of these papaya. You can't even finish for a month, man. So 12 months, you have plenty of fruits, okay? You will survive. And if it's not ripe, you can do the like the Thai papaya salad, the unripe one. <clears throat> and then the banana flower, I use it to do FPJ banana, fl banana flower. Okay? So that's one part. The second part is the raising the fish. So in this area, the fish is also seven. You can dig out two ponds, simple two ponds, uh, three meters by three meters, half a meter depth. But when you dig in the center, the soil that's put at the side, the, the dirt, it will rise the, the, the depth of the pond level. So on the right-hand side bottom, there's a, another small little uh, trench or what to grow dark wheat, which is the food for the fish. So the poop of the duck or chicken or the fish, you put into that pond, the three meter by one meter, and the dark wheat will grow. So this is an example of another six by eight. What's the size like? That's only, I put one pond in there. And then we dig out. So this is, as I say, as you dig like half, you pile it to the side, it becomes higher. So this is the concept, the water is pumped up and then it goes through the two channels on the right. One that's going to flow down, I'll put dark wheat and the other one, it's uh, supposed to be a uh, kangkong, it's called a water spinach. So it's something like that. And then you need to put a, a tarpaulin. So in many areas, this is to prevent the, the dry season, the water from drying out from the pond. And then this is without a pump system. So there's growing this kind of water plants. And the small little green things are also dark wheat on top between the plants. And there's fish inside here. So usually we grow a tilapia fish here and catfish. There are many other fishes too. And this is dark wheat. So you put the poop inside there. This green little salad will grow very fast. But you've got to shade it a bit and then you feed back your livestock. So this one is being done in Nepal. A simple teaching to them. So just dig and then you put this uh, gunny, uh, these plastic bags to so that's prevent the sharp poking of stones onto the plastic uh, tarpaulin and then you put a tarp and then you fill it with water and then on the picture on the left you can see a pipe that goes there's a brick putting so the water is pumped up and then it flows down this channel where you will plant vegetables so all the poop of the the, the fish is de deposited on this ground and it's like a fertilizer for the plants. It will grow very fast. Okay. And this is a bigger scale in Nepal. 
So they dig the ground like that, put the tarps in. So the cost is only the people, uh, it's low cost people digging and then buying the tarp. And then uh, fill it with water. And then to prevent from birds, they use the bamboo to make this covering from attacking. So the, the pond on the top most of the picture on the right, on the right hand side of it, there's a space. So the space is depleted like in the picture on the right now. Similar thing, you pump the water from one side, it flows down. So all the ammonia nitrates is deposited and the water flows back into this bamboo, which is many holes and the water drops down and creates a ration for the fish. So this is another project in Indonesia, in Kupang. So they have terrace gardening. So uh, this is like terrace aquaponic system. So this is the final, that's what you can get the fish, for, the water for watering the plants as well. It's, it's uh, extra fertilizer from the fish water. And this is my place in the base camp. So I started with uh, doing a, a aquaponic system at the wall. So I don't have air pumps to aerate because once the power is gone or air pump, all the fish will die. So I, I'm using just the dripping technology where it creates bubbles. So this is the tilapia fish. And uh, the ferns over there is for the pest control from Jadam. And then the plants grow on top. And then on the top right hand, there's a blue drum. It's called a swill filter. You cannot have the traditional aqu uh, uh, aquarium filters where you have a filter and charcoal. Because in one day, it will just clog up system. So the water flows up into the thing through a pump and then it goes down inside here. I'll show you a clearer picture after that. But the, the, the liquid at the end of two weeks or one month, there's a small tap on the left hand side of the photo. You open up, the water will flow. So all the poop, the heavy fish poop is collected at the bottom. So it goes through a stirring motion. So this is, uh, it's, this is I want to show that you also can do above ground pond using steel. Instead of digging, all right, and then uh, fill in water and then put into this, and then the duckweed can grow or can put fishes. This is duckweed. And so the swirl filter looks like that. So the water is pumped up, then it goes, the picture on the right, it goes into this thing and then it flows. So it's in a circular motion. So the water goes up, the top funnel will, will collect the the water, which is the least uh, uh, poop, fish poop matter will all sink down. And at the bottom, there's an inverted funnel where at the end of the month, when you open, it comes up by sex, uh, suction. And at the bottom, in the middle of these two pictures, there's a, a power uh, thing like a power controller, a timer. So I use that to turn on the pumps in the morning and turn off in the evening. So this is another aquaponics system, which uh, initially I was uh, looking into hydroponics, but uh, hydroponics, the problem is the chemical fertilizers. And secondly, is uh, we are at the mercy of the, those chemical fertilizer selling the fertilizer to us. If they increase the price, if the people is poor, they cannot afford it. So I decided to use aquaponics. So I have nothing much to do. So I did a lot of pipes. <laughs> And uh, with these pipes, you put in the vegetables. You don't even use the cups. These are called kangkong. And then the water is pumped up through the, a, a filter, the same soil filter on the left, and then it grows. And I use the netting to cover. And there's lots of fishes in here too. So it's not difficult to grow fishes. And this is dark wheat. So we collect that. And we feed back the fish on the main. Okay, so the next one is uh, the next section is the 10, <coughs> the, the vegetables. You only plant like 10 of each variety, but if you have a family of just say uh, husband and wife and children, about two or three, five people, you, I think you need to plant only five 
of each variety. But if you have 10, you have more than enough. Okay. So same, look at the size of this 6 by 10. It's not very big. So, and you have a netted area for your nursery. And this is for a continuous cycle. So you have six box areas. One box area could be 60 by 60 centimeter. So for this example, uh, we, in here, we eat a lot of uh, spring onions and uh, kangkong, which is water spinach. So you plant in each of these box. So when the first box area you harvest, you don't uproot it, you just cut above so that it can grow back like spring onions. So you could eat that for two days. Then the third day, second box, the fifth day, the third box, the seventh day, fourth box. So when it reaches the sixth day, the sixth box, the first day will have regrown. So you can start harvesting. So you have a continuous cycle for something like spring onions or the kangkong or water spinach. Okay. So the other thing, I also teach them to do microgreens to grow because it's the fastest. These are the different microgreens that you can harvest in a month. And then the extras, they can replant it. So this is like uh, part of the lesson for the microgreen. Okay. And then I also teach them about raised garden beds. But uh, I use the wood raised garden beds, but after a while, all the wood gets broken and the soil, everything is so messy. So I've told them to use the bricked up garden beds. So the, yeah. And then from there, I did the drip irrigation. And these are some of the crops. So imagine you have five or 10 of each of these crops. That's more than enough for a family of five or more, uh, up to 10. So these are some of, and some of the things I also teach about uh, this kind of raised garden bed, like uh, what is this wicking, wicking bed inside here. So these are some of the fruit trees that's been taught. And uh, to create some jobs also, I've also taught how to make the vertical growing drums from this uh, 44 gallon or 250 liters. So you need like a, a drill and a jigsaw. This is in the field and these drums you can get anywhere in the world, plus the pipes from your construction uh, material, construction sellers locally. So you cut the pipe. After you drill and jigsaw, you clean the inside and then you have to use a burner to heat up and put the bottle to open the pockets, something like that. So those tubes are for the worms to go in and out. And then you can make the stand. The stand is better because once it's on the, the materials are on the stand, it's like around 100, 100 to 120 kilos like that. So it's difficult. Or if you can't make the stand, put on bricks. So these are the, the thing, like the measurement, the secret is in the referencing of the, of the lines. The rest are not difficult to do. Then you have total one, two, three, four, five levels, nine pockets, there's 45 pockets. So you can plant uh, like 45 veggies on the sides and some more on top, different crops. And in the center, there's a tube where you open up and put your leftover food. And then the worms inside will go in and out of the soil and eat. And then the, the, the pea, the water is collected at the bottom. You dilute 10 times and you just pour it on top back. So this is how it looks. So this is for the least space. So this is like when it's growing. So most of the crops you can grow, some not very well, some is better. So this is like bitter melon or bitter god. On top, you have tomatoes and everything. So this is the drums that have been testing now on the many different. So the one previously, which you saw is on a four by four meter, you could you could put like uh, nine drums in there. This one is a bit more, there's like total 28 drums. So I'm testing all different vegetables. So then Jadam uh, and Pest Control and KNF are all in there, which I'm using. So the next section is talking about poultry. So the poultry, the poop, you can use back to fertilize the plants as well as the food. So you need the whole four recycled thing. So this is at the, the, the place just now you saw with the, the fruit trees, the what? So they started the duck thing. So there's duck rearing. So on the right hand side also is another duck weed pond to feed the 
to feed the ducks. So these are the ducks. So for myself, I'm into quails. <clears throat> so I built this cage. Uh, for me, it's more on space. So uh, how to maximize the space. So this is a two meter by 60 centimeter and 1.6 uh, meter high, a quail cage. So each level, I put around 50 quails. So you can see there's a section bottom where it's the poop area. It's a bit bigger, so the smell doesn't go up that much and I can collect them out. And there's a water feeder. So I don't, ha I don't have those, uh, those like the chicken one where you can, they press on it, the water. So I have to make from the pipes locally here. So there's another float bath. So that, that, that boxed up area is where the poop is. So it's a white space. So I have to clear it. And then from that, I put it on the <clears throat> vertical growing drums or, or on the ground as a fertilizer. But at the bottom also, in this quail cage, the box, I put some coconut fiber. You can put rice husk to absorb the water and sp also spray the lactic acid. So these two cages in only the small area, this fence up area is most is uh, three, two meters or three meters by five meters. So I have two cages can hold up to 300 quails, 150 each. But if you were to rear chickens, it will take up quite a huge space for 300 and the amount of feed. <coughs> so at the center, it's all been hooked up to a water thing at the center between the two cages, if you could see. Right. So these are, I get around 100 eggs a day, a lot <laughs> from 150 quails. All right. So this is the watering system for auto water system. And it has a flood, flood valve to control the whole thing. If they don't have food, it's all right. If they don't have water, they will die. <laughs> food, they still can fight each other for food. So uh, this is the float valve. These are the quails. Okay. Sorry, repeat that. So the eggs, uh, there's a secret is in the feed also, it's in the feeding, that's why I get quite big eggs. So what I do is uh, I help these people that are interested, so I give them 50 quails each. <clears throat> there's around 40 females and 10 males, one to four. So from there, they get it, they get in, immediately, they have the eggs for them to eat, and then from there, they start the quail. because uh after a few a, a month or two then they're interested in incubating then i help them with the key. so this is a person that incubated and they gave so it's like a multiplying thing now to help these poor people that are interested so they are really farming so the next thing they have to get incubators too so this is the incubators which i help is only like 85 us dollars so it's uh i've taken out all the chicken one but i only put the quail so it's around 300 quail eggs you can incubate it's there's seven sticks here and there's 22 two levels so this is one of the people that help so it's 85 so they usually give me 50 and i support the other so 35 so they can like go on to the next step and this is my uh incub uh, my incubator for 300 dollars all right it's in cambodia so i i'm more focusing on quail eggs quail now because there's not many people doing. Everyone is doing chickens. <clears throat> so the quail eggs take 17 days to hatch. So once it's faster than chicken eggs, so two weekends and then it comes out quite a lot. I put 100 eggs. Voila, headache now, man. <laughs> the next few days is headache and you get addicted to hatching. <laughs> and the secret I told you, it's about the soya bean. So many places, they don't have like uh, spe selling special food for quail. So you got to get the chicken feed. So with this chicken feed, uh, there's two kinds. One is for the baby chicken and the other one is for the layers, the, the hen that's laying eggs. So the first six weeks of the quail is crucial growth. So I have to fry the soya bean, dry fry, no oil. And then I have to grind it. If you don't fry, the soya bean has a toxin on the outer skin. When you heat it, it melts it from the cracking, you know it's gone. And then you've got to grind it. Okay. So after that, after the soya, you add 
There's two kinds of feed in Cambodia. It's 510, you can see it's 21% protein, and the other one is 17% protein. So what I do is, I take three kilos of the whatever feed, multiplied by 21% protein, add one kilo of soya bean, there's the amount of protein in the soy, one kilo, and then add them, there's total four kilos, and increase the protein content to 27%. So with this, the first six weeks, you can achieve the maximum growth for the quails within six weeks because you give them the maximum protein. At the end of six weeks, you start, the female will start laying eggs and you can start eating the quails from the six, one and a half months to two, two weeks. Okay. Yeah. So this is, so I separate that into, uh, instead of four, so three kilos to one kilo. Three kilos of the feed outside of the one kilo of roasted. So I separate this into, uh, instead of having three kilos, one and a half kilos of the feed. At 500 grams of soya bean. And that's for the six, first six weeks. After six weeks, this is the eggshells I got from the chicken, the quail, everything recycled. Fry them after frying the soya bean and through the grinder and grind them. And some I keep it for the KNF making the calcium soluble and this one I add back into the feed so the same this is for 43 days six week onwards that that's for the laying of the eggs so it's only 17 percent so I add another kilo it brings up to 24 plus the eggshell is five percent of 50 grams 25 so total is around two and a half but if you double that it comes to four 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 kilos and 50 grams but with these two kilos easy to mix them up thoroughly so i feed the quail so that's why it's growing fast so those knf those fermented uh, fermentation of fertilizer i use them on the quail too <laughs> they're all very organic that's why people come and buy so i also teach them how to make the organic fertilizer using fermentation but i make it simple like a cookbook so they can be interested in cooking uh, don't throw away so rice vegetables is actually FPJ and and then the rice wash is uh, LAB, eggshell is WCA, fish scraps is FAA, any bone and a bit of OHN. So this one they can, so it's been, uh, so these are the things that the book they have written. So it's been translated in a very simple book. So this in Cambodian, I have in Thai, I have in Nepali, uh, Hindi, uh, and uh, Indonesian and Malaysian, and Chinese also and Korean. So these are some of the things teaching them how to do. So, all right. So this is the run through. So this is the LAB which I make. So this one I give it to the quails every two weeks. One I add only ten ml to ten liters of water. So after fermentation, then I put vinegar. Same twenty ml. Let them drink, and OHN also like ten ml to ten liters. So I let them drink. At the same time, I spray on the quails and the poop area. So there's no more smell and everything got sprayed down because later the poop down there, I put it on the ground for the fertilizer. And then I add the banana flour to the FP for the drink also sometimes and the calcium. But this calcium, I mix it with crab shell. Uh, after I met, I went to GCM in Korea two years ago with Ray. So I was trying to figure out how they got the GCM from the crab shell. So I, I thought taking the crab shell and pounding it, it could be the same effect. So I did some with brown sugar and some, so this is part of the thing. And also I put sea salt, one gram to, to one liter of water. So usually I make a bucket of 10 liters to give them. This is for the drinking, not the spraying. The spraying is only three. The, uh, the LAB the, and... Uh, vinegar and OHN. Okay, so this is the chart bones for the plants which I give and do. this is for the and then the fish uh, fish FAA is on my right. So th that's I give to this, I teach them also. And also I've been testing with Jadam organic fertilizer and been teaching this too. So doing this uh, potassium hydroxide which we can get from the soap making shop and then 3.6 at liter and then that's what you get 20 liter and then i've just got jerusalem artichoke from australia someone sent it to me in the mail and it took me five weeks 
but it didn't get rotten. So there's some pest uh, control properties in there. Because if they send the thing were been all molded and rotten, but it didn't. Only certain parts got brown. So I just slice off everything. It's still all right inside. So this is the Jerusalem. So boil it. So I just use uh, 300 grams boil in five liters to four liters and then add it. Then same with the agriculture sulfur. All right. And two kilos of sodium hydroxide. So you get this uh, one, a wetting agent, and second one, the herbal solution, and this one. So this is the tree I apply for the pest control. Every, uh, so this is from the Jadam, the sulfur, and the, they are approved. So this is the bucket of water. So 200 of the soap, 400 of the herbal solution. And then this is supposed to be 40. So there's the sulfur, agriculture sulfur. Then I have a soft water thing. And then I spray onto the plants. So I spray every, the KNF every week. So, and then the uh, Jadam thing also every, every week, like seven days. So it keeps the pests away. So from their book also, I use sodium hydroxide to treat the snails. I add like 60 grams in the 20 liters with uh, the soap. That's all 200 ml of soap. It will, yeah. And this is my mango tree. So I've been putting lots of things and the flower a lot by allergic to how to say hay fever. So it's not good. So anyway, the next stage is just making the, the flowers. So this is my friend's house. Like in it is in Australia, it's a townhouse. So he also got the idea. So it's he's planting plants and using this drum. At the same time, he's doing some quails. So uh, that's what I've been teaching, like how to be sustaining. And this is some of the quail poop you put on the drum. The dry, this is like their, their quail. So from their house, they can be self-sufficient with certain crops. And this is another organization that they were having because of the COVID, they're having financial difficulty. So I helped them to make the same thing, the cages for the quails. Right. And quails doesn't have disease. I haven't encountered any disease. So with that, he and then he started to invest in an incubator. I helped him with it. And then start to have more and more. And then uh, these are the drum. And then he started his, his... So you have vegetables. He even planted a papaya tree somewhere in the middle. All right. So back to this 200 square meters of land that uh, firstly many people in cambodia doesn't have land especially the poor so they could borrow someone's land to to, to do this self-sufficiency so for example a person uh doesn't have a job or any money today he wants to eat so he could go for the sweet potatoes in the morning pluck a few sweet potatoes get a couple of quail eggs and a banana that's for his breakfast then lunch he could catch some fish three tilapia fish a couple of tomatoes, a cucumber, eggplant, and a pumpkin. And he already got his food for that day. And then there will be excess sometimes. Sometimes if you don't harvest two papayas, one is rotten. So you harvest, then the neighbors can come and buy. So you will already have the self-sufficiency for that day, the food. So in this small place, small land, it's easy to maintain. You don't need to go like for... 500 square meters, if they can manage the 200 square meters land, they can start off with another 200, the same concept of these four things in there. And for me, I once these things all get set up, maybe it routines, vegetable, quails within three months, fish also maybe to grow, maybe eight months, the trees and vegetables is very fast. So once they're set up, and if they are doing well in the it maybe you take the maintenance one or two hours a day so we are not really converting all of them to become farmers but have a bit of able to produce by themselves and then if they're hard working they could mount duplicate this same lot in another 200 square meter next and the whole next lot they can sell for the income but my purpose right now is to create a few community the people that help around that they will pull the resources so the next step is having an app 
a, a computer app where just say I have uh, 100 quail eggs and uh, uh, 5 kilos of bananas and 5 fishes, I just enter into the app. And then there are other people who has on that day, they just enter into the app and then we can what? Like it goes into like a marketplace. So we, we, we can order this, then we put it, the order, and then it will send a message to each of the farmer to, how to say, pack this and send to this person who ordered it. So that's the next stage of building the community for the poor. So uh, any questions? <laughs> Sorry, that's all. That's I finish. Any questions? So this, this, these are the things I've done. One in Philippines. So Philippines just before the COVID. Yeah. So they it's helping them. So yeah. Are you finished, Joshua? Yes, I'm finished. Yeah, can fast. you yeah. can you stop the can you stop the screen share? Yes, sir. Hang on. How do I do that? Sorry. Yeah, wait, wait, how do I? Okay. Am I out of the screen share? Yeah, yeah, it's all good now. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. I, I really uh, appreciate. Uh, just to give you guys some more intro, I met Joshua in Korea. We were having some farm tours and uh, we had a uh, natural farming international workshop where before the COVID we could all gather and uh, we had a book launch ceremony and everything. And I, uh, I was very impressed with his work because this guy is uh, a man on the field actually doing the farming that can really benefit the people, helping with the food self-sufficiency. And uh, I'm really, I really like your work. And I have, I, I wrote down, I wrote down so many things. I have so many questions, so many comments. Okay. But I'll just start I'm with one. Expert. Okay, You're right. I'll just start Go with ahead. one. Uh, first one is, uh, uh, I I saw that you are uh, growing duckweed, yes. and then you feed it to your birds, right? Correct. I have to dry the birds. I oh, know I have to dry the duckweed first for the birds. For the ducks, okay. no. You just chuck it to them. The chicken mix it with the things and you chuck it with them but the the for the for the quails i have to dry it and you are feeding the i mean you are giving the uh, animal poop to the duck weeds right yes 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 so my my question is uh have you tried giving the poop directly to the fish i haven't because psychological problem after that i'll be eating the fish that smells like the poop <laughs> you understand yeah, because uh, I, I, I i've heard that people telling me to put the poop into the thing but i i wasn't really you know i, I said i'm going to eat it after that and i know that smell is from the quail poop so so <laughs> yeah yeah because uh, i uh, i heard of uh, people um for example, you can feed like uh, if you have catfish, mm. you can feed like uh, pig manure or all those uh, uh, animal poop. You can feed the right. fish, and then so you reduce the re you you reduce the energy loss because you 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 reduce the what is it you re you reduce the steps. You don't yeah. go two steps, or you just go one step. Understand. So you reduce Understand. the energy loss in the in the middle. Okay. So same same with the when I saw your uh, tube, yeah, you have the tube and you have the worms, correct, and you put the and uh, food waste in there to feed the correct. worms, right? Correct. So I think the food waste can go directly to the animals instead of going to worms and then to soil and then to plants and then to animals. Okay. So you yeah. reduce all those middle steps. Yeah, understand, understand. Yeah. I, I will try that fish one for the people outside, but for my own one, I won't put the poop, man. <laughs> because <laughs> paranoid. <laughs> Some psychological problem, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, the, sometimes I put some sea salt into the, 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 the pond to replace back the, the minerals for the fish. I do that. The sea salt, right. one gram, just once in a while, not always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I've just added like a burned rice husk 
like biochar yeah. so i can get the i can buy it's not expensive it's like 250 for one big bag 50 kilos of the burn rice husk so i i i, I sprinkle onto the ground evenly and then i spray those knf on top of it and after that i covered with the coconut fiber again so here coconut fiber is very cheap here i can get so i i don't do really i wanted to do bio char but not not necessary yeah. how about uh if you have the uh if you have rice husk but yes. biochar yeah you, you yes, have the I have rice husk biochar then why don't you put it into your animal house so that animal poop will charge them uh directly instead of having uh, uh thank you for that thank yeah, you for that the field yeah, thank you for that. that. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. <clears throat> because I just only put coconut fiber when they poop, it doesn't get so smelly and not so watery. So it will absorb. Yeah. So right now I will put the uh, biochar, it's like the activated carbon. So it will absorb and break it down faster, right? Something like that. Yep, yep, yep. So okay, I'll do the biochar that. is do that. also, uh, uh, Paul was saying that it's uh, the best one for uh, absorbing any smell. Because yep, they, they catch all the nitrogen particles. Right, right. I, I was using the LAB to, to clear off the smell, but the vinegar also to disinfect a bit, plus the quails, to clean the quails also with the vinegar to spray on them. But they drink too. So it's, yeah. Uh, feeding corn, the feeding, and, and also I forgot at, the, at six weeks' time, when the quails are at six weeks' time, I weigh them. If they are more than 200 grams, I will separate them because I'm going for the next generation of a bigger quails. So if those more than 200 grams, I separate them. So next, the, so put them together with the father and mother like that. Then the next one for this more than 200 grams, they will produce a bigger, bigger quails for the next gen, next gen like that. Yeah. So the quail project is right now everybody and also uh over here there's a delicacy called uh balut you know about balut right of course yeah how do you explain to the people there <laughs> i don't know whether it's <laughs> good to say that they love to eat this so i put the eggs instead of 17 days they come out at the 10th day i take them out and i can the sell pale, them pale eggs pale eggs pale egg balut correct I oh. found the market. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, usual so eggs, two. Usual eggs, 100 quail eggs here is so cheap, okay? It's only $3.25 US. Okay? Yeah, US dollar three twenty five. So with that 100 eggs, 10 days old one, right? It's six fifty. It's double. So I, need any... to, I need to explain to everybody what Palut is. Okay, right. Please. Yeah, yeah. Palut is a... Uh... The, the egg the egg that they eat in uh, Southeast Asia and uh, it's uh, like half half hatched egg <laughs> so so uh, it's, it's, it's not the egg that you normally eat but uh, it's a uh, slightly more developed than the original egg so that's that's a delicacy over there so Joshua is saying that he's found the normally they eat the uh, Chicken egg balut, but uh, Joshua is saying that he's found the market for quail egg balut. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Maybe not very good. <laughs> but it's, it just came. And I'm the only... So I told the people, don't start any chicken or anything like that. Everybody's having chicken. You start quail, they will, they will have the market regardless. Yeah. And one quail I sell is only 62 cents unslaughtered. All right, that's very cheap here. <laughs> yeah. So. And yeah. Uh, another uh, another, uh, it's not a, it's not really a question. I uh, I had an observation about uh, uh, your your you are frying the soya beans and then you yes. feed it to your quail, right? Yes. And because you are worried about the toxin in the skin of the beans. Soya. Right? Be yes. Correct. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, this is just my idea because uh, frying also you need the fuel and energy, right? Yes. 
but uh, so if you if you actually cook the beans and then you can ferment them right cuz uh, there's at least uh, there's at least three ways of fermenting soya beans one is okay. the 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 tempeh like in the indonesian method yep yep there is the uh chongukjang or the uh natto in japanese we call it chongukjang in korean they're slightly different but there's this yep. this one is the fermentation of beans with a uh, hay basilus right yeah that one hay basilus no it's like the natto la, the japanese natto. Oh, yeah, that, that one natto. that one yep and the third one is the the meju that I was introducing yesterday. It's called meju. Yep. This one is uh, Korean traditional food. Right. But I believe uh, this kind of fermentation will get rid of the toxin and actually increase the nutrient availability for the animals. So it, it can be better. Right, right. Okay. I will try. I will. So, the, 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 sorry, I missed that lesson. So you boil the soya bean? Yeah, you boil it. Okay. The, the then... easiest, uh, the easiest one is natto. Natto. Yeah, that one. Uh, uh, it only takes about four days to ferment. Okay. And uh, yeah, I yeah. think you can try that, right? Okay, I'll try that. I'll try that. Yeah. So yep. And what yeah, but uh, uh, Paul Paul Olivier is actually mentioning that. <laughs> right. Uh, if you use soybean for animal food, actually that is uh not fully uh efficient because it's actually human food so i think of what he's saying is that you can because you are using for example banana stock and everything they go to the animals right, right. so it's better to actually feed the inedible stuff to animals rather than ed edible ones but, right uh, right but i guess this one is where uh, uh marketing concept comes in yeah which one is yeah. more profitable yeah Someone asked, like Kim asked, can can someone post the fermentation methods for the tree? I would like to have that too. What the fermentation methods for the tree? Okay. Uh, yeah. How can you get that? Yeah. The te the tempe the tempe I have not done, so I don't know. Yep. I, I only know that it exists. Uh, and the the number three, the meju, that one is very takes very long time. You're right. It takes many months. So for raising quail, I think the natto method is the best one. Best one, okay. So uh, I'll I'll just check in the internet. See how yeah, yeah, I yeah. think just ball ball and just ball and keep it aside or what it will ferment anyway. Well, actually, uh, I I uh, natto is not the right word because natto is the Japanese uh, fermented beans. It's slightly different from the. Korean one that I'm trying to explain. It's called the uh, Cheonggukjang. Yeah. Anyway, this Cheonggukjang uh, is a. Uh, it's very simple, so I can just explain. You cook your beans. Yeah. Uh, you cook your beans, and yep. then uh, you don't you don't need to mash them. You you have the all the whole beans, right? You have the whole yep. beans. You cook it. Yep. And then uh, you ferment it with hay bacillus. Bacillus. Subtilis. This one. How how do you get hey basilis? I don't get that one. How do you get that one? What is the? It's everywhere. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. It's so, everywhere. So so you you boil the beans and then what you do with the beans? Just leave it there, covered up for four days. You boil the beans and then you you put it in a warm place. It has to be, uh, it has to be warm. Right. Okay. Because these. Well, hey, Basilus, they like they like the heat. So it should, it should not be fermented in the cold. It should be hot. Uh, so you, I, I normally cover it with blanket and then put put the uh, electric heater on the bottom. Okay. Because in Korea, it's normally quite cold. Too cold. So, yeah. Uh, you need to maintain the heat. Not super hot, but you put your hand in and it's quite warm. That's good enough. Quite warm. Okay, I understand. Understood. And then the uh, the important thing is that this hay bacillus is aerobic bacteria, aerobic. Okay. So they like air. Okay. All right. So once in a while, I will open the blanket and I will just uh, shuffle it so they yep. they get more air contact. Okay. 
and then about four days you will have fermented uh, beans, chonggukjang. So four days when you ferment, what will be the color on top of the the, the, the liquid? Will it change and the smell? How will it be? Well, it will never go bad, right? It it will have a lot of sticky uh, sticky threads. You you okay. you you mix it. You you will see a lot of this sticky stuff. Yep, just like very, the very natto sticky. like that. Just yep, like yep, the natto yep. when you eat. Yep. Okay, yep, that understand. one. Understand. We'll do. We'll try. It's, it sounds very simple. Just boil and leave it. <laughs> That's a cover. Oh yeah, yeah. Boil and leave <laughs> it, right? <laughs> boil and leave it, and open and close a few every day once and look whether and the fourth day stir it okay i'll try yeah, that one that's uh yeah. uh in in traditionally we uh we used the uh, hay the rice straw and we put it into the beans to inoculate the beans but i uh, i tried this method but uh it's very easy to get it contaminated so uh, so i tried it without the rice straw and it just just work, works just fine, same. It works the same. So, mm. because that bacteria is everywhere, you just uh, inoculate in in the air, and then you just leave it, and you will have the good fermentation. Mm. Thanks, yeah, Maju Bacillus. Yeah. And I haven't. I have not tried the the drum. I I saw your drum. Uh, yeah. Growing plants in the drum. Uh, yeah. What happens to the the shady, shady side? Because the, the sun is only side, coming in one direction, right? No, it doesn't. It goes north to south. Some parts, like the plants, will be less able to grow better. But those areas doesn't really matter. You could put like a watermelon seed, and then the watermelon crawl. <laughs> so it doesn't really matter if it's not facing the sun. Okay. So certain certain veggie crops, yeah, but I get more for the fertilizer, the liquid fertilizer from that. So that that one you need a bit of uh, a bit more work into maintaining compared to a garden. All right, right. That means you 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 like you have to water them, the, like go round the thing, or you can put a like a drip system on top, which I. I have no time. I got no time to. I was going to do that, but yeah. Okay, and, so the uh, jump the drum could like help them to create job, but the main thing was to get the organic fertilizer for them in the beginning. You know? mm. Yeah. So in your in your system, uh, everything is. In, in a closed loop and cycling within the system, right? So all the Correct. fertilizer you need is you get from the animals it, and then it goes to the plants and then the plant matter goes Correct. to the animals and then cycles, right? right. Correct. Correct. That's a very, very good idea. Correct. Yeah, yeah correct. And, uh, and I, I mean, this, this one, ideally, the four should be close together, but it's not necessary. Sometimes you could be have your pole in the garage. Do you understand? Your, your quails mm. could be in the garage and then the other tree section outside or the the fish could be by itself and then your plants and the vegetable but the concept is total you need 200 square meters mm. so it's like the farmer who has the rice field right or the banana or even papaya plantation for example so if he has the 200 he could have every day have their, his food needs uh, met but for his other crops, that one is like income, an extra income at the end of six months or four months when he harvests. So I see many of them, they like the rice, when they get the money, they, they spend and then they pay back the loan and get into loan. And then after that, they got not enough money to eat the good food because they are not, if they just raise the, these things, they have enough good food and good health. But they're still buying from outside. Yeah, yeah I, I and the really, price uh, of things are going up. Also, is the cost of things have increased because of the recent petrol increase in twenty five percent. It's jumped up. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate your uh, humanitarian and warm heartedness behind all your work. <laughs> oh. You know, I, I just, but I've seen some results. <coughs> that the people are doing it 
So <coughs> I told them, don't think about, don't think about selling now. Just do well. Think about you don't need to come out money to buy the food. That is the main mentality first. And after that, you will have excess one. I told them you will have excess. Yeah. Yep. So uh, we have some more questions. Uh, yeah. How do you how do you deal with human manure, human waste? Oh, human manure! I don't do anything. I just do it. And actually, it's a. It's actually I was thinking, it's a good, uh, good fertilizer also. I'm yeah, sure because the fertilizer. Yeah. If the farmer is eating from the garden, yeah, the farmer should also recycle it back to the garden. Yes, but I, I, my place, I haven't created that system, man. I haven't taught them that. I don't want to be the. I better build my name just organic. After that, oh. He's the poor man of organic. <laughs> so, but yeah. Uh, yeah. For, for, for your information, uh, mm. in Korea, in some parts of Korea, we used to feed human poop to the pigs. Yes, I heard that. I think that's the yeah, most so tastiest. It's, it's not a very strange practice. <laughs> <laughs> but the pig is the most tastiest there one, <laughs> special pig. <laughs> yeah. I haven't, I have actually taught uh, like people if they, you know, uh, the, the poop one is uh, very important. I told them, but I haven't talked about the, what is that? The, the human one. I've asked them to collect your, your cow when you put all one side, your, your, your chicken poop, but spray with lactic acid. I told them to, to, to break down faster. That's what I, I, I just taught them. I'm not yeah, sure I... whether it's correct or not. <laughs> Yeah, Paul, Paul Olivier is also saying that uh, you can collect urine yes. and then give it to the duckweed to grow right. grow okay. them. So, yeah. and I think, uh, uh, in my opinion, if it I, is too radical to use human manure as animal feed, at right. least you can ferment it and then use it as compost. Right. Or, or you can actually uh, use your human poop to grow maggots. Yes, 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 yes. And maggots can go to your quail. Quails, okay. Understand. Yeah. Sometimes the quail cage underneath there, the, the poop I don't remove for a long time. The maggots, I think it's black soldier flies anyway. It's some sort of maggots that come out. So I say, oh, this beef, man, it's beef for the quail. So I start sweeping, hey, have a beef meal here. <laughs> because hey, uh, a, I, have a, I have a I have a good idea because uh you can actually collect the quail poop mm. and also the human poop and all these poop, if you if you collect them and you give them enough moisture, right, all the maggots will come in. The flies okay. will come in and they will have maggots all over and the okay. maggots can all go to your birds. Understand, understand. Yeah, that's understand. even uh, saves the cost even more. Yeah. You, I, 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 uh, I will next time I'll, uh, yeah, I'll tell them to do that. But I think the poop should go through a, a, a process that at the other end they can collect and put onto the garden. I, I, I'll think <laughs> about that process, man. I'll think about oh, that yeah. because there's like, I've been to Israel, so they have this kind of like peeing water. It goes to one pond with a different kind of plants and then after it goes to another pond another kind of plants and then by the third pond the water come out from the urine from the trop is like kind of filtered so i think the poop also needs to go through some sort of process like that right i'm not sure or you just get into your tank and then or poop it out that is flat on the area it's like white flat area so it gets dried up and larger area for for disintegrating uh i i you understand um, I, I i i'm thinking about if, if i were to do because this is more on the field kind so the, i could say okay you dig one trench all right and the poop all go inside there let the poop flow in there how do you process your poop instead of just poop and go into a ground and the hole is covered how do you take out the poop or you you poop directly and put it looks very disgusting on your veggies <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
for for processing the poop, I think the the uh, the easiest is you just put it in a, one corner of your farm okay. in your garden. Right. And if you if you mix it with like uh, dry leaves or grass okay. or rice husk, uh, sawdust, uh, yep, leaf yep. mold, those things right. are you you don't have any smell, right? It, and right. you just leave it there for about six months. Uh, you you are in the tropics, so it might be faster. So faster, you will have faster. the poop all all uh, decomposed, ready to use as compost. Right. That is the uh, that is the easiest, but uh, actually the the best one I think. Uh, my comment is uh, uh, this one. Uh, the important thing is you reduce the energy loss in okay. the treatment. So it's like uh, if you if you have food, right? Humans eat it, right? That's right. the best way of conserving energy. But if you have food and you compost it and then you feed the plants and then you eat it, that's a lot of loss of energy, right? Energy, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you have poop. You compost it and then you feed it to your plants and then you eat the plants. That's a uh, two step. But if it's, you have poop and yeah. you feed it to the animals and then you eat the animals directly, mm. it's much less loss of energy. So that's the key point I want to mention. And Paul Olivier was very clear about this point also. So this is, I think this, this concept can give mm. you a, a great inspiration. So the, 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 okay, the, the human poop, I'm a bit, I mean, like, we always use cow manure poop. Sometimes we handle with the hand also, the cow poop, because the cow is eating grass only, right? But for us, like humans or pig poop, right? Because we eat all different sorts. Are there any bad pathogens that will be transferred if we don't do a step before applying straight in the plants? Do we, I mean, do, do I use lactic acid bacteria to spray on the poop? Number one. Number two, do I use OHN, OHN to kill the pathogens? Or oh, no, not no, necessary? I, not necessary, yeah, right? Uh, this, this, is, this is my view. So okay. Okay. People, <laughs> might, people might not agree, but my, in my view. Yeah. Uh, Next time when I people go want, to your gut, go for it. I don't, I don't. Uh, yeah. I don't, I don't like, I mean, you have to be careful about mm. being input addicted. Yeah. Right, understand. Yeah, mm. we think like uh, inputs are something that can solve everything. It, it mm. solves some, some problems, but not everything. And then yep. we tend to think only in terms of, uh, how can I use an input for something? But uh, I was mentioning yesterday that the best input is no input. Okay. Because right. nature, nature has all the input already. Yeah, yeah. And if if we start to ask questions like, uh, is there, isn't there pathogens in the poop? Uh, isn't there parasites in the poop? Everything. Mm. Actually, we lived in that natural system for millions and billions of years, mm. and now we come and ask those those kind of questions. Mm. Uh, what, what I think is that nature has been making things work for right. much longer than and much better than our human knowledge and human mm. perspectives, right? Mm. Mm, okay. So if you do have like a parasite or pathogen problem, uh, there was there is this idea of hot composting human manure. So yeah. you increase the heat for right. fermenting your human manure and then you can kill all those right. that's a good idea but uh, you need to do some work like the turning and um, taking care of the composting pile right yeah okay boy well, okay the, the poop one i will <laughs> i will use the quail one on the fish first all right and then <laughs> i'll eat the fish because i'm eating that too <laughs> yeah 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 there's some very nice uh comments coming up in the chat Mm, thanks. Constructed wetlands work very well uh, for purification, I think. Uh, yeah. And pigs eat their own poop once poop. it's dry Correct. already. No it's like a crunchy tasty. biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder. <it's... laughs> Don't try it yourself, Joshua. No, I know it's uh, Tim Tams for them. Tim Tams. Okay. <laughs> crunchy biscuit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm reading through that. 
Yeah. Mm. Yep. So, yep. Yeah, there's a very nice comment from uh, Al Chamika. Mm. When I lived in Zambia, I usually stopped in a farm to buy crayfish. The, mm. the crayfish were grown in a container pond mm. and the owner had beehives over the pond. So the beehive is on top of the pond. So all the dead insects will fall in. Yeah. And then they can the, be, become, become a feed. Yeah, understand. Yeah, this is similar to what I was saying yesterday. Uh, there's this design where you have rabbits, rabbits on the wire mesh. Oh, right. And then you have catfish below. Okay. So all the rabbit poop, poop. the rabbit, rabbit poop is actually a feed pellets. They look like feed pellets, right? Yes, so, correct. And then the, the fish will eat the uh, rabbit poop. Okay. I think I'll, I'll start I'll start doing with the, the, the quail poop, man. And my quail poop is very high protein one. Have the leftover soya bean, so the cycle goes here. Yeah. yeah, so I think uh, definitely the fermenting of soya can help you, and then okay. also the Thanks. making better use of the poop will help okay. your system. Understand? We'll do that. We'll do that. And Paul Olivier is also commenting. I let human poop with biochar turn into a hard stone. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm not sure what's hard stone, but uh... hard stone maybe it becomes black like a stone. So how do I send the? Can you turn your trash in your treasure the, the PDF? How do I send to somebody? Send what? My my some of them asking. Oh, how, how to turn your trash into your treasure, that simple cookbook, which I made is basic. How do I send it up to, can I forward to you? Uh, to the email? I don't know if this has any file uploading functions. Yeah. But definitely, uh, Peter and I can receive it from you and then connect with anybody that needs it. Right. Yeah. There's a few people that's asking it. Could you please enable copy on the chat team? Noah Medlin. Noah is asking, wanting that. Steve Diver. Okay. Let me copy Steve Diver's email first. Oh. There's a few people that So if if anybody that needs something, email me and I'll send it out, or or Peter can send it out. Yeah. So I I I will send to one person. I don't have to do that, right? I'll send to you, Ray. So, Steve and Steve and uh, Noah has submitted their email. You got that. Yeah, I think uh, uh, not not just your file, but I think uh, if we have the emails from anybody who wants to join, we can create a network where we can share all these uh, good information. Yep. So anybody uh, interested, send me an email with your uh, contact information and I will create a contact list, contact network and share with everybody. Yeah, just I just uh, shared my email. So not just uh, Joshua's, but uh, everybody else's uh, presentations or any information that we want to share, we will create a contact network and share all the information. Because yeah. uh, I really want to see something <clears throat> in action moving forward as a result of our conference. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the biochar lesson today. I learned uh, quite a bit about adding more biochar, okay, and also about the poop. So I'll start small first. <laughs> yeah, because it's a, uh, it's all about uh, what is more efficient. Yep. If you add the uh, biochar to soil, that is good. Mm. But if you add mm. biochar to your quail poop. bedding, that is even yep. better because it directly charges and inoculates the biochar. 
understand understand got it yeah and also there was a uh, another question about uh bean fermentation uh meju and miso right yes so miso miso is the japanese version of korean uh denjang they're very similar but i don't know how miso how they make miso i can i can explain about how they make the korean uh, denjang and the meju is you you cook the you cook the beans and yes. the Cheonggukjang, the, the natto one, I was explaining that you have to, you just leave it as a whole beans, right? But the meju one, you mash it, you mash it. So you create a, you create blocks, blocks of mashed cooked beans. You, you create a block and then you, you, you aerobically ferment it in the air. So it has a good, good uh, ventilation. And it takes about three months, four months to ferment because it will it'll ferment very very slowly and yeah. it combines aerobic and anaerobic fermentation together that's where i was talking about the yin yang concept of fermentation in the meju process mm. uh, as the as the block of bean dries out uh, the fermentation will be completed so and then and then actually uh, that meju is where all the soya sauce comes from <laughs> so the, you, everybody's familiar with soya sauce because we eat it with uh, Asian food every day, but uh, the source of the soya sauce is that fermented bean block. Mm. Uh, not many people are aware of that. Right. Right. So, okay. so I explained that one and then... Okay. Okay, so the time is... We have about three three minutes left. Any more questions or... Do you have any more comments, Joshua? No, I hope that, yeah. Thanks for your input. Thanks for, yeah, I learned something. So that one I should improve <laughs> the poop. Yeah, thanks a lot. And yeah, thank I you think, uh, for your time to listen. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, whatever you, can, you uh, want to share, if you want to share anything that could help me to help the people, please go ahead. Send to Ray any notes, the any parts of the different parts. You can see all the different parts. It's like there's a fish, there's poultry and all those. So please do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's all about uh, growing together. Uh, we yeah. share the information, we share the knowledge, and then we help each other. We grow together. And yeah. then we can do more things uh, mm -hmm. for, for more people. Yep. Yeah. Okay, it's uh, 10, 10, 14. Yeah. Okay, uh, 